as the rain pounds outside, I welcome you back to the not-so-levity zone. I've been pretty concerned lately, along with many of my countrymen and countrywomen, and would like to share with you a few words on the recent so-called election here in the USA. The following was recorded on the eve of the new year of 2017 and offered to you on the eve of the so-called inauguration of a non-elected president. So from my heart to yours, here it is. I really need to get this out of my system, this uh, election thing, election 2016. Well, from the point of view of a Canadian raised in Canada, in our lawn chairs, ever looking south, watching America, it's quite a spectacle. And I want to say that the outcome the election of Donald Trump as president is a natural thing for where America has gone in the last 40 years or so. And many others will say this better than me, but the election of Donald Trump is a non-election. No one who voted for him understood who he was. Fewer people voted for him than the other candidate. He didn't represent an ideology, or even a party. So there were no voters for Donald Trump. So in some sense, he's not elected. So what put him there? Well, on the surface of it, lies put him there. He showed, again, as in many cases in history, you can lie your way into anything. But lies require the hearer of the lie the believer of the lie. And in this case, people were willing to and prepared to believe the lies. So it's an interesting two-way thing going on. You have someone willing to completely lie and invent stuff to get somewhere that perhaps he doesn't even really care about. It was written that Donald Trump couldn't care less about the people who voted for him. He spent a lifetime stiffing those people, not being anywhere near them, not doing anything for their benefit, stiffing small business. So they voted for a guy who has no history of ever working in their interests. It's an amazing sequence of events. So did they vote for someone or against something? Probably they voted against something. But what did they vote against? They voted against a trend in which they are becoming irrelevant. And these are the people who built the country. These are the descendants of the white people from Europe who built the railways, who worked the forges, who worked the farms, jobs that they used to have historically. These are the people who built the country from the days of the pilgrims. So they have some kind of an ancestral memory of this. So they voted against something. They voted against diversification. They voted against their economic situation. But the economic situation was created by people like the guy they voted for and by the policies of the party that they voted for. But the candidate wasn't even part of the party. The party tried to disown the candidate. So few people voted in this so-called election that it didn't really represent people anyway. Money bought the ads. Large interests paid for the parties. So in the end, you have a non-system and a system that completely broke. And in the end, the outcome was completely unpredictable, not controllable by the pollsters, the pundits, or the funders. So you end up then with a non-government. It's not even a government, at least in its non-elected branches. So what do you have? You have a system that's completely broken. And it isn't that putting the other party back in is going to change things much. 
And in a sense, it's about disenfranchisement. And it always has been in America. There's always been large-scale disenfranchisement of groups. And in the end, everyone was disenfranchised by money in politics and disempowered. So perhaps what the federal judge said when I was sworn in in the year 2000 was correct, that the system of national government is closed to you as citizens, that it is not a democracy. It is closed to you as citizens. And it has been closed to ordinary people for a long time, maybe more than a century, maybe forever. Maybe it was never intended to provide access to ordinary citizens. It seems to me that a country founded by wealthy landowners who held slaves and who fought taxes and things like that, feared the masses of people, wouldn't create a government that really represented the people. In the 1820s and 1830s, the masses revolted when governments tried to remove their stills and parties gave away free hooch to garner votes. So there's always been this fear of the masses and this manipulation of them. That's what America's about. And of course, the last 30 years, the lying has reached a craft that was never even seen in the Third Reich, the lying on television networks. That lying has created a population that doesn't know what truth is at all. Then we had the format of reality TV, which is now what we have on the national stage as a pseudo-politic, as a pseudo-White House. So if you propagandize and you drum into people so much of this media, so much of this distortion of information, and you don't give them the tools in school of objective reasoning and skepticism, this is what you get. So America has gotten the natural outcome of all of these forces, of money controlling things, of propaganda and distortion of, of people. America has gotten itself exactly what the recipe called for. It's gotten the dish that the recipe called for, precisely and exactly. In previous episodes, I've talked about the need for a constitutional convention. And of course, that happens and can only happen either through volition and a movement that decides this is what we need, or perhaps a complete breakdown of the system, followed by a huge amount of, of pain and turmoil, and then the coming together of groups. That's a very, very painful path. So People have to have a will to save the system and to save the country in the way it is. So what happens next? Well, what happens next is pretty clear. It's what's been happening all along. Regions are pulling out of a dysfunctional central system. If you ask Jerry Brown, the governor of California, he might say, well, we've been pulling out of the federal system for decades. They banned stem cell research. We supported it. They went after medical marijuana. We legalized it. California, as a separate country, is the world's sixth largest economy, ahead of France. California has tremendous power. It has power to do infrastructure and create energy policies and creates jobs. It creates wealth. So California pulls itself out. Not seceding, but simply not cooperating. So in the great tradition of America, the great experiment of America, the states each become part of the ecosystem of the experiment. But that ecosystem starts to devolve. Massachusetts gets universal health care. Other states do it. Weed is legalized everywhere. The people want it. They pull out of the federal system. The DEA tries to use a heavy hand to schedule one things like cannabinoids, which is absolutely ridiculous. And so states and individuals stop believing in the DEA. They don't give it any credibility, and they block its actions. 
agencies become discredited, federal agencies. So the central government weakens, even at the agency level, as it has weakened at the legislative and executive level. So expect to see a lot of craziness, a lot of crazy making in the next few years. Expect to see the gridlock getting worse. Expect to see crazy rules passing and decrees and lawmaking that are counteracted by forces, gradually nullifying the power of the central government. The weakening of the central government will pull the system into a new dynamic. So those institutions will become damaged and be replaced by other institutions in regions. So on the eve of the New Year's 2016, that's my lawn chair observation about America here. But is this my battle to fight? I can talk about it in my talks, I suppose. But perhaps my mission on this planet is not politics, it's not the fight, this kind of fight anyway. The fights that I've chosen are scientific battles in the origin of life field, the push and shove of putting out a new paradigm and shifting science, and talking about the origin of consciousness now for a conference in Shanghai in June. Being a representative realm bender, using visionary thought experiment technique for a new world perhaps to come. This is my way, this is my calling, more than the politics of the day. Of course, I'm hiding out here in the mountains, here in the redwoods near Silicon Valley, surrounded by Richistan, a protective bubble of rich people, high-tech, and powerful liberals with lots of food produced, good quality food at that, and rainfall, which we're getting back into now. Maybe our drought is, is ending. So I chose this place, this town, Boulder Creek, and the Redwood Forest, Ancient Oaks Farm, and this hut on the hill was built as a sanctuary in a protected envelope away from the madness that is America. So when riots are occurring on the streets of Cincinnati, it, it will seem so far away, but still so close. And what a shame if this is the way it goes. All through lying, the telling of the lie, the manipulation of the minds of, of people who are hardworking and innocent by a few in the end, society will have to decide whether psychopaths are allowed to hold positions of power. Clearly, several of the last disastrous presidents have had the psychopath character style. And this one is going to really show us what that means. We need a means test. We wouldn't let a pilot take the controls of an airplane who had very poor vision and wore Coke bottle glasses. We'd never do that. So why do we allow individuals that you know, lack an empathic sense to ever take the dials and levers of power? Of course, they have the ability to overcome any obstacles to power. But perhaps we're going to have to create a new type of elder, not a Supreme Court, not a protest movement, but a group of elders who can bring adult supervision into the system again. And of course, the other path is just the push and the shove. Human beings, the manic monkeys, the mixture of the bonobo and the chimp, the inheritors of mitochondrial Eve's brilliant gene, but carried around the world by the manic male proto-human with the spear and the bloodlust, the inheritors of the civilization at Eleusis, the opening to individual and personal contact with the ineffable, with the energy, but living within the structures of hierarchical bureaucracies, the church, the corporation, and the state, 
the monkey mind so malleable it will believe anything, but that it can imagine anything and do anything. Such ironies that take us into an uncertain future. Thank you for listening to me, dear Levity listener. Thank you for helping me get this out. If you want to hear more on the concept I mentioned, a constitutional convention to radically remake America, check out Levity Zones podcasts 31 and 32. A constitutional convention would be a best-case scenario for where we might find ourselves as a country if we ever come to our senses and decide to remake how we select and manage our leadership. In future podcasts, we will take up the origins and nature of power to continue this exploration.